Welcome to That Moto Show with Dirt Bike TV's Jay Clark and producer Donnie Bales. Number six. Hard to believe, but we are six episodes deep. Uh, what do you think, Donnie? Yeah, yeah. They're going really well, and it seems like they're going quick, although at, at time it... Uh... When we do the way we shoot these, it feels like they go pretty fast. Okay, it's it is pretty fun. It, I'm I'm having more fun with it than I thought. I was a little bit reluctant to do it, um, but the studio has been updated. You you thank you for your efforts there. I tried to make it a little spruced up. I couldn't stand that white door, and <laughs> and also we have the KX back here. It's a little updated. So for those that don't know, this is the KX 500 build that we did. Donnie and I worked on over over like a year plus range and uh we did we shot it with motocross action this build was really involved to say the least right yeah yeah it's the coolest thing i've ever owned though i'll tell you that so we for those that don't know and and i've had people email me and they're going to build a kx500 and they want the, some info so i sent them the build sheet where we list everything out and it's on our website as well when you go to our website um and that's they're overwhelmed because they want to update it to kx 450 brakes rear and front and put the front get clamps made and all that well it's just very involved if you it's a commitment because you're going to spend more than a new bike to do this and people don't want to accept that like i could just buy a new bike yeah then buy a new bike i said i tell most guys just to fix up and clean up the old one and don't worry about updating it to because most guys aren't going to ride them really yeah i think updating it is I don't want to say the problem. It's like this is something That's what created. So this much is work. something I want to do because of of actually MC's bike because he did that yeah. KX500. That KX Guru helped us a ton with the frame because we welded on the mounts for the uh, the pegs. Uh, was it, uh, Raptor had the kits right? Yep. And so they're the ones that had the full kits, right? It, that's, that's it was Raptor. Yeah, yeah the they Raptor make the, the peg mounts. We had to get those welded in and frame all gusseted. And KX Guru is a group of guys who are, it's like their their hobby is KX 500s. They love them. And they, yeah. they live in different places of the country. And they have organized these things. Up. And Tom Morgan as well. And right? yeah, he helped us with the engine. Because he was Team Green Guy forever, yep. right? And so he, he made the engine with an auto decomp, which is cool. Or, uh, you know, not auto, but you have to push a button. Uh, a decompression mm -hmm. release for on the head makes it so easy to start. That's what's really fun about it. When we have it at the, like the Langston show and we can start it, every digs that. We'll have it out the two-stroke race probably. And yeah, if, for sure. If all goes well at the end of March in, at Glen Helen for those that are around. So anyway, really cool bike. Decal Works and ODI and Dunlop and just some great companies in that thing. Sano helped us a bunch, right? And, yeah. Uh, FMF custom stuff there. Don't forget John from Applied. Yeah. You know, port, you know. Rest yeah. in peace. Yeah, he, he did those clamps, for and that's us. what people ask me about. We can't get any more applied clamps. Sorry, guys. Yeah, John passed away a couple. It's been, been a couple years now. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm. So anyway, um, so um, anyway, really cool bike. I get, now I get sad when these guys. Uh, yeah, it's you know, really sad. On. Yeah. All right, we got some great people that have passed on. All right, so uh, remember, if you want to ask your questions uh, on the show, or if you have tech questions, email us the tech questions and try to include pictures if it's something that that can help. So uh, email us those tech questions. The, also, the next big thing is we have a brand new video on brake bleeding. And we use the Vacula, a pneumatic brake uh, bleeding tool that really helps a ton on time. It, it saves you so much time when you're using this tool. Um, if you're going to be into moto very long, I would suggest you get one. Um, it helps immensely. When I bought this one over 15 years ago, there wasn't a lot of choices. And this one was pretty dang expensive way back then. But now there's less, less expensive options. And on our Google Doc, we have a link like on Amazon. You can find some good ones for like 85 bucks. That I know that it saves me a lot of time because anytime I need to bleed something, I take it to your dad's house. <laughs> yeah. And we knock them out pretty quick. Huh? Oh, yeah. So quick. Yeah. Spencer and I just did the five CR250s that I'm building. Everybody must know that I'm building five CR250s by now. And we bled them all over. Like Why not two, six? Because that's too many. Too, too many. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. So we simply just bled them all. And we only had one bike that had a problem. On one break out of the five, you know, 10 breaks, only one had a problem that we had to go back to. The pistons were stuck. And I think it was mainly because they sat so long after I rebuilt them. They sat so long, maybe weren't lubed enough with brake fluid. So they sat so long. Gosh, they, they could have sat six it, months. It, it was they like, for sure sat six months because I helped you rebuild them. Right. And, it was, and it was hot. They, they yeah. were in the back shed. Like, yes. Yeah. So they sat without fluid in them. All that fluid I had in there when I assembled them dried up and the pistons wouldn't move on the master or the, uh, the caliper. So hey, that goes to show what can happen to brakes just by sitting. And, and another thing is I bought a bike with only a half hour on it. Brand new KTM. And it was only, but it was a year old, year over year old. All the fluids look terrible. So it tells you these, you know, these new bikes. You want to flush out that fluid within the first few months. You, I would get that fluid out of there and get fresh fluid in there. Um, the antifreeze, a coolant is usually fine. Uh, we like to do the oil straight away, but 
uh, but the brake fluid and and clutch fluid, I like to change that stuff. Straight. Even gas just sitting. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 We all know how much damage that can cause. So, yeah. um, also the la uh, one other reminder on YouTube videos, we have our a couple months ago we came out with our video with 125 hacks and tips for your dirt bike. We get tons of good comments every day from guys watching these videos and this this long video, and it's like 40 minutes. And yeah. it has a hundred, hun what's that? Yeah, it is. It's, it's 30, 38. And it, it, we cover so many topics. So if, you, if you're curious about a lot of things, go there. Also, don't forget our Google Doc. And you can get there from our website, which you, when you email me, it's j at Dirtbike TV one And it's our website, Dirtbike TV one All right, Spencer, you're Questions. ready to go. So Spencer's uh, joining us again. Glad to have you here. I'm here. So he's been helping us a ton. We've been riding a bunch in Southern California. The winter's Make it nice to go riding. Yeah, it's pretty nice out right, right now. Right. So we got to get you out some more. All right. Spencer's going to get us going with some questions, right? Are you first or Donnie? Donnie's first. All, All right. Go first. Let's go, Donnie. Rob B. wants to know, do the factory Supercross teams run tubes or mooses? Always wondered about this. Okay. So good question. Um, in Supercross... They all run tubes, heavy-duty tubes. Uh, you know, Dunlop does basically all the teams. So we've seen when we change tires, not super heavies, but just the good heavy tubes. And those Dunlop tubes are a little harder to find, but you can buy them. There's also some good ones out there. But you want that good, that good rubber is a lot different than, say, an ultra heavy. It's really difficult to work with and very difficult to install. So they will all run tubes and Supercross. And I think that's for feel. Um, and if they had a moose on there, I just don't think that the, the rare cases of a flat and supercross are so small, they don't, they're not too worried about it. Now, outdoor motocross, so you're talking, you know, High Point and Southwick and Redbud, all those tracks, they're, all the factory teams run a, a moose in the rear and a tube in the front. That's all they do. And the reason for that is they're much like, more likely to get a rear flat than, than a front flat. So, Will those guys destroy a moose outdoors in one moto? It's pretty soft, but they also run them a little softer, a little bit softer than a standard one. So, so yeah, I don't think they'll run them. Uh, they wouldn't rerun them. Uh, typically. So one moto, one moose. Yeah, I think they could get two. They could get two motos, I would think. And 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 I think it would still be fine for a regular guy. But the problem is they're 19 inch mooses, which a lot of guys aren't going to use in off road. Like we're only off roading with 18 inches. Mm -hmm. Oh, good point. Yep. Joe B mm -hmm. says, "Hey Jay, loving the new podcast. Keep up the good work." My question smart is smart guy. Yeah, right. Okay. What what are your thoughts on KTM moving their factory to China? Do you think this will affect their sales and do you think the bikes will be as good as they have been in the past? Okay, I didn't see the news that came out on this, but I've had a few people write us and they're all paranoid because this is shifting. So, from what I understand, this is only going to affect some of the bikes that were already being made in India, like the Duke 390, some of the less expensive street bikes. And the quality, I think, is going to be very similar. I, I don't think you're it's it's a it's a lateral move and it, they're probably doing it for um, supply issues and being able to, to deliver and probably quality, they, they must feel they're going to get as good or better quality. I doubt that we're ever going to get uh, KTM, like the bikes we ride, the motocross bikes or EXCs or XCFs, I doubt we're ever going to get those made in Taiwan or in China. I don't think that's going to happen. Now, from what I understand, the Triumph bikes are all made in a factory in Taiwan. Um, well, you know that like Honda, yeah, everybody has, manufactures parts of their bikes and, and not in Japan. Like I know that Honda's mm -hmm. frames are made in Indonesia. And they have and some South American facilities. South American. So all the manufacturers have part of their bikes being manufactured mm -hmm. in other countries. Right. So I, I don't think it's going to affect us adversely for, for what we deal with, but think for the lower cost street bikes. And that's what's going to keep the cost down if a guy wants a Duke 390. for the, Those things are pretty inexpensive. They're, they're going to want to... Uh, it, that, that's what keeps those costs down. So I don't think it's going to be a big deal myself, and I don't think it's going to affect our bikes. Yeah. All right. What do you got next? Joe O. So, so we got Joe B. Now we got Joe O. Mm -hmm. uh, says, 23YZ125, jetting, ish, jetting carb issues, update for others Okay, out so there. I just want to yeah. – okay, I remember this question. So he's got a 23YZ125, uh, which is a very new bike. They switched to a Kian carb. He found a he he's fighting some jetting issues and he took it apart and he found out that the block jet gasket was messed up. Now this has been happening way more often and so I don't know if it's a combination of the fuel that's terrible now or the gasket itself or the assembly of the carburetor is not as good as it was and so that's what we're seeing. So either way if you're fighting some type of jetting issue and you change jets and it's not making much of a difference I would look at the block gasket on about any carb now on, on these two strokes, especially right there. That that gasket and JD Jetting has those 
those block gaskets. And there's some videos, plenty of videos. If you Google block gasket and you put Makuni or uh, Kian, uh, you can put that on there and you'll find him. All right. Uh, Tiny Moto Garage asks, do you prefer O or X ring on non road bikes? I went with a regular chain for my super moto as it gets lots of attention and low hours compared to road stuff. So I, I prefer an X ring chain. It's kind of in between. So an X ring, a, a regular chain nowadays, they say regular. So with no O rings and everything, that chain is fine for like a 125, maybe a 252 stroke, but they just do not last long enough on any four stroke anymore. Four strokes put so much load. And if you get a 350, 450, putting so much load, you're just going to go through chain and sprockets. And I know you're adding weight back there and it's unsprung weight and this and that, but most of us aren't going to be able to tell. Now the race teams are all running for the most part, regular chains, and they'll run some, some X ring outdoors. Some of the teams, uh, your wheel doesn't spin as well when you're washing the bike. So that's why guys will want that regular chain on there, but it goes away so quick. Um, the stock KTM chains are one of the few that are really strong that last a long time. The rest do not last at all. So we prefer to run that X ring that has a thin O ring system. So if everybody thinks it's an O ring, a true O ring. It's not a true O ring system. And we'll put a true O ring on say our dual sports, our EXCs. And that's just a thicker, heavier chain. And that lasts for a long time, especially if you have a steel sprockets on there. Okay. Oh, and, and oh, the brands, we run the pro X one, but it's a little harder to find. So there, there's some good brands out there. Regina, um, what, what are some other ones? Uh, DID, uh, RK on the um, on those. We found some good ones in that. Nice. Okay. Michael C. I'm new to dirt bikes and have a new YZ250. Don't, we don't know if it's a two-stroke or a four-stroke. No, it's, I'm going to assume two-stroke. Yeah, okay. Not racing. It's just for fun in the woods. I'm using pump casts. Seems to run great. Is using pump gaps damaging my motor? I wouldn't think it's damaging your motor per se. Now, on that YZ252 stroke, the fuel is not good enough nowadays. So if he's getting into any muddy or sandy conditions, any hill climbs, he, he's risking detonation. So I would run at least add a gallon or two of C12, VPC12, or Avgas to lift up that oxygen. And I think there might be another question later. I can't remember if we have it coming about adding uh, fuel boosters. We're not usually a fan of those. We haven't had a big luck with those. So it's easier for me just to add in that C12 or Avgas to boost up that that uh, the octane of the fuel and get you some more octane. And, when, and like on a two stroke, if you just added one or two gallons to say your four gallons, you'd be fine. And and it, now if you're rate now if you're racing two strokes, big difference. If you're racing motocross or doing serious hill climbs, and wide open stuff then I would probably run straight C12 or Abgas. Do you remember like everybody ran that PJ1 octane boost? Yeah. Everybody. And some of them, some of them will actually turn your tanks, the bikes that have, they'll turn your tanks the brown. Like if that, you had a Suzuki, yeah. it, would, it would turn it this nasty brown. If you had a white tank, it would turn it brown. It, oh, was, yeah. it was pretty gross. So, pretty hard on the plastic. Yes. Yeah. It was, they, they, some of them are really tough. So. Some fuels too are even more acidic than other fuels too. Right? Yeah. So we've had real good luck with, with the VP, with, um, and then we run T4 and the four strokes. And with, the, with those and, and Avgas, we haven't had any problems, and they last so much longer than pump gas. So I don't think he's hurting anything, but I, w I would boost up the octane a bit if I was him. Yeah. So Matthew S. left a video on our YouTube video for uh, 350XCF Goldilocks video. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. You can go check that on our YouTube if you want to watch it. This one's with Donnie's bike XCFs is yeah. XCF right and he says for trails anything to improve transmission I find that mine stalls out when chugging on second gear pretty easily difficult to start the bike in anything other than neutral even when it's warm that's with new master cylinder slave clutch cylinders so okay so two two questions there so first one the our bikes start fine in in gear when they're totally hot fine. Yeah. Now, so I think part of that is his clutch bleeding. So this will go back to what I talked about before of, of your bleeding and flushing. I would have fresh fluid in there. Check that. The next step would be if you're still having problems, I would go one tighter on your clutch adjustment. You know, it comes in two. You could go to three to make it stiffer pull. We run number, f we run a 450 master on most of our 350s. It has a stronger pull and that could help on that case. Uh, and sometimes some of the masters aren't as good as others. We've we've just have found that unfortunately. So the nine masters, what comes stock on a KTM 350, 250, 
and there's some of them just aren't as good. Now, the other question was stalling. I don't know what year his 350 is, right? It doesn't say? He does not say, okay, but so I assume with because he's have, asking about our video. We have both generations of bikes, so let's yep. say the new generation is 23 to 24, and on those bikes, we went up two teeth in the rear. To a, it's 47 stock, we went to 49, and we think that's perfect. We did add the Blaze uh, clutch weight. Mm -hmm. um, it's like nine ounces. We add that to the clutch, which you have to be kind of careful lining up. We've had a little times where we don't get it sitting right. Get that sitting right. You're golden. That thing does help on the stalling. The other big thing is the mapping from Jamie at Twist. I say that all the time. Sorry about that. But the ECU uh, mapping from Jamie at Twisted will help on any flame out or stalling. So those things combined, you're good. If it's the older generation bike, that bike had a 14 front and 50 rear. We played with some gearing going up in the rear, but what we ended up doing is just putting a 13 tooth front on the XCF. So that'd be 16 to 22, 350 XCF. We just went to a 13 rear, a 13 front, and that solved our problems as far as gearing goes. Because the older bike, that gearing's uh, uh, worse off, I feel like. And that 1350 is good for most riding, I feel like. All right, so hopefully that helps our 350 XCF guy. Very good bike. And we know that that's one of our favorite bikes all around. For sure. For sure, yeah. David B has a question on his 2022 Honda CRF 450X. And he's having a question about some part availability, right? He says, hey, Jay, I have the subject bike and I'm having trouble finding aftermarket parts, such as frame guards and other items. Do you know if there's a reason that this bike seems to be out on its own? Uh, is it just that good? LOL. <laughs> so here's my thoughts on this, unfortunately. It, Honda used to be, Honda and Yamahas were the only thing that people made parts for. That was what you always made parts for first, aftermarket-wise. Now, um, KTM, Husky, Gas Gas, those models are taking that attention, especially for the off-road uh, community. Aftermarket companies only have so many resources to spend. Now, on a Honda, say like frame guards, it's an aluminum frame bike. I don't know that it's that critical. Uh, but skid plates and those types of things, everybody's making most of that key stuff. One of the things I do, of course, you, know, you can use our Rocky Mountain link, but when you go to Rocky Mountain, one of the first things do, I'm doing if we're going to look at a bike is I just go to hit select the bike and I see everything that Rocky Mountain offers for that bike. And that'll give me some ideas of things. And you just go scroll through the pages. You can see everything that's available for your bike and what companies are making stuff. I will say that that I just think there's a lot less stuff being made for the Hondas than what we used to see over the years. So unfortunately, not a ton. Um, I'm not sure if that bike comes with a fan. We, we tried to add a fan to the RX and we had to do some customizing. We had to make our own with a Tusk fan, which we have some, you know, some Instagram videos on and we did, we, we got it working pretty well. So uh, ICW helped us with a brake bracing. We featured that fan in episode two. See, this is why I have Spencer. Here. Yeah. So he'll remember these things. You so showed the radiator two, with the fan on. I did show that. Now yeah. I'm like, I think I showed that. I told Spencer. Could he tell in like on any page of the Google doc, could he tell you where things are on the pages? No. I don't think he ever has looked through it. Not, really. not real well. I mean, it's have like, you looked through that Google Doc? Oh yeah, but we got, we're getting it cleaned up because it's been. Tough. It's, I've gotten it down like a page or two. The problem is there's just so many. Yeah, yeah. we got them broken into categories. You know, like air filter, or chassis, engine. There's like a guide on the side now. If you open it up in a computer, it should be easier to yeah, go through. Tabs. Well, yeah, yeah, like the chapters or whatever yeah, for yeah, the yeah. document. Yeah. Okay. All right. What do we got next? Patrick S says, "Hey Jay, wondering if you have ever heard anything like this on a KTM. Very strange noise that it makes. It's a 2020 300 XC. Won't start, but makes a clicking noise by the battery, as well as a horrible sound coming from what seems to be the starter motor. Battery is 13 to 14 volts, so I believe it's good. I would think the next step would be test relay and look for grounding." But with those noises, I'm thinking something must be wrong with the starter. Have any ideas of what it might be? Luckily, it has a kicker for when I'm riding anything other than open trails. It gets frustrating kicking, however. <laughs> well, first of all, you know I wouldn't have ever put up with... <laughs> for one second. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, right, I would have been parked. He, he, wouldn't have left, he wouldn't have left to go trail riding. He wouldn't have left to go trail <laughs> So, okay, but he, so, but he wants to ride. He's going to ride it. Don't blame him. Yeah, even if he had to bump it down a hill, he's going to ride. So... Uh, I, what I will say is, uh, and I gave him some advice already. I have, he sent us a video. We're going to have it play right now, right here. Listen to that sound. That's just the, the starter is spinning on the Bendex. So the starter is sound. I'm sure the starter is fine. It's stronger than the Bendex, which there's a picture of the Bendex right here. 
And it's not too expensive just to buy. You have to buy a whole new Bendex, and it's really not that big of a job to switch this Bendex out um, in those. And it's pretty common because it's on these bikes. And so that bike's four years old now. And that thing probably, depending upon how and where he's riding, that thing could get started. Spencer and I counted once. You could start 40 to 50 times in a day on trail riding. You could hit the starter. We counted on a, like a long trail ride, a five, seven hour ride. You could hit that thing over 50 times. And so that's a lot. And so you're just really, when you considering when you go to the moto track, you might start it three or four times. I just had somebody tell me, um, not they had been out of moto for a while and they don't they'd never had electric start bike and they're like oh i wouldn't trust that thing i go let me tell you man. it's the only thing you run now and i've never had it fail i mean a bendex like this that could happen to anybody honestly and and that's but that's one that those two strokes like that's because it's been used so many times yeah. you know over, you think about it seriously it's getting used a hundred times more than a motocross bike. And if you happen to have an issue and you have a four stroke, we have a video in our Google Doc mm -hmm. of the of a similar issue, not the same. On the it's not a Bindex, but it's a four stroke, and it's the uh, the starter. What, what do you what do you call that gear that gets the that starter gear? Away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah starter yeah, gear. The starter gear bearing, yeah. or whatever that pushes yeah. out. Yep. And so throw, it happens with four strokes yeah. too. So I think it's just on a spring the way that yeah. works. Mm -hmm. So we've had to change a couple, two of those now yeah. over the years on the four strokes. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, the, it's the trail ones. It's none of the motocross no, bikes. Yeah. yeah. Never a motorbike. Like you said, you're starting it how many times on a trail a day? Yeah. It's crazy. It's like nine, it's like 90% less you would start your motorbike, right? I'd be more worried about draining my battery than I would be about the starter. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you got, Spence? Xavier C says, Hey, Jay, sorry to bother you on a Saturday. So he must have emailed you on a Saturday. Nice. But hey, I'm sure you actually responded because you're, <laughs> you're, you're dedicated. But he had a quick question. He put a hole on the left side of the case with somebody's foot peg. Still a little bit of oil left in the bike. I didn't notice until I pulled it into the pits. Do you think the motor was hurt or is there anything I should check for? Okay. So luckily, you can see the picture here of the broken case. Um, and, and I did ask him via email, I said, and it sounded like he pretty much hit it, you know, got up, rode it back to the pits. He only rode it for a couple minutes back. He drained the, I said, Hey, drain the oil and see how much you have left. So if you have a situation like this, you want to drain all the oil, maybe the filter, drain all the oil and see how much is in there. If you have four or 500, say half to a quarter left and you didn't ride it very long, it's going to be fine. Uh, that oil and that thing's hot. It's all lubricating. Now, if you run it down to where there's basically none comes out, then you're going to be in trouble and you're going to want to inspect, especially the top end, uh, the valve, um, the cam towers will be lacking uh, oil. That'll be one of the first places that gall up and you want to check that. So uh, we broke a case on this same bike last year just with a rock at Glen Helen on Co when Cody was riding it and it, we got it welded up. This one's too big to weld up. You're going to have to get a new case. Did you hear stories in the late 80s and 90s where factories, when they'd have to crush these bikes, how they'd run them out of oil and just... Oh, just keep them penned until they would blow up. <laughs> I didn't know that. No. Yeah. And they lasted way longer than people thought they were. Right. Would. I could see that. They oh, just cool. kept running. Yeah. They're like, yeah. like I'm talking like 10 minutes. Like it would just like yeah. w under wide open throttle. I could see it. Yeah. I could see it. Cause yeah. you still got residue oil in there and, and it can, and everything's so well built. I yeah. can see it going. Yeah, for sure. Jason E. and a few others. Hey, Jay, please add me to the list when you sell your CR250s. I'd be interested in one or two. Many yeah, thanks. Yeah, so there, there's our CR250s that we're building. That we shot that one with Dirt Bike Magazine. We've gotten most of them started. We're still dealing with a couple gremlins. Uh, so it's not easy doing an older bike, 30-year-old bikes, and then to do five at one time is really tough. So we got a little gremlin we're dealing with right now with one of them. We think it's carburetor-related, uh, but we've gotten... Uh, all five started, but uh, four um, are running pretty good. They all seem good. One of them is not running so good. So, But the five bikes are coming along well, and we probably will end up selling these things because everybody goes, why wouldn't you want to ride them? I go, we got so much work in these things, and I have brand new 24 bikes, all of our choice of bikes, and I don't need a man cave momento like what Donnie's got here with the KX500. At least we do start and ride this thing every once in a while. But... Um, so we're probably going to sell them and re recoup the, uh, time and cost here and build those things. So yeah, you can email me to get on the list and we'll let you know, we're going to be doing some more filming and, and photos and everything with the bikes when they're done. And so in the next few months, they'll probably be there. Any idea how much time you have into all these at this point? No, it's so much. You got to no. start us using a clock and counting. Seeing <laughs> it's too much. Man yeah. hours. Yeah. We don't want to keep it's, track. Yeah, it'd be depressing. I think I think he wouldn't do old bikes like that if he knew how much. Oh time. no! When I asked him to do this, he was like, "Oh man, it was a struggle for him." <laughs> I, I took this bike apart 
Yeah. And that was... That you was, did it in like an hour. Yeah. But that was like uh, the most that I did because I, uh, I was at college most of the time this was getting built. Yeah, but yeah. it's time for Product Spotlight. Product Spotlight. Okay. Spencer's on it. So we're going to talk about FMF, Turbine Core 2.1. Or just the, uh, you know, you can be the regular one. It doesn't have to be the uh, the 2.1, you know, the big one. It can be the regular size FMF. What we're going to talk about is the spark arrestor system. So a lot of guys ride or race in areas where you need to be spark arrestor legal. And the, the, the awesome thing about the FMF system is when you throw this on a bike, this is actually going on our 17300. Um, when you throw this on a bike, you don't seem to lose much performance at all, especially on a trail bike. Um, and the, the reason for that is, is the flow that this is able to be spark rest legal, the way they've designed this to catch any type of potential sparks. But I think we all kind of agree that a two stroke isn't throwing out a whole lot of sparks. Okay. Unless something's really wrong, but it's catching in here and it allows for proper flow and they call it a turbine core because of this, this unique shape to it. And the advantage over this, over guys, what can be bad, I see guys will just clamp on or rivet on a end piece that then becomes spark arrestor legal. And the problem with that is it's stopping up so much flow, the thing will be oozing and catching and you, you, you'll be running, it'll be all clogged up, typically with guys where they're running a clamp on or ex external spark arrestor. So we recommend getting the real deal. If you're going to be spark arrestor legal, we would go with the turbine core from FMF. That's kind of what the system looks like. I, I, I When I was talking to him the other day, I'm like, hey, can you send me one of the inserts so we can explain this whole shape to it? And this is sitting in there just like this, uh, in this, in this shape to catch everything. And it's a really unique system, and I think on most two-strokes, most guys will barely notice the power difference. Now, if you're racing motocross, obviously, you're going to be fine with a regular one. But if you're riding in the woods um, and need to be, cow need, to be street uh, need to be spark arrest or legal, which is most forest, in, in especially in the western United States, uh, this is a great option for you. So hopefully that helps you out on you sparky guys. Yeah. Speaking of FMF, mm -hmm. John R., asks, hey Jay, just saw your startup video of the CR250 build and noticed the factory raw finish FMF pipe. Wondering where you source that pipe as I'd love to get one for my 93 CR250. <laughs> now we're adding into the uh, to the added unnecessary work to, to these bikes, kind of like what we did with Donnie's bike. And we, and we probably still will do one of these for Donnie's bike someday. So what we do, FMF on these older bikes, and I totally understand, and, and we're FMF guys, okay, at heart. We bleed uh, red and yellow, right? So these things, they only make the chrome version, and it's too much. You might think, oh, why don't they just hold some back from chrome? The place is, you know, it's all they can do to stay up with everything they're selling. So to try to pull back four or five pipes that don't get chromed, it's a, it's a hassle. So we had to get the chrome pipes we got them stripped, okay? So this is a process. Depending upon where you live, they need to be acid, just a special dip to get the, remove the chrome. And out here in Temecula, there was a place that had a minimum of like, a, like 75 bucks and I could get two or three done at one time. So I got them dipped. And that's pretty cheap because most places want like 100 bucks just for one pipe to get dipped. So we got pipes dipped and then I sent them to Robbie's Pipe Repair and he blasts them. And then we got the FMF badge and welded it on and then he blued up the welds to make it look as good as it as it can for being not a full true factory fatty pipe, you know. So pretty cool look, a lot of work and cost to even just do the pipes. And, and it's more maintenance once it's done like this. Yeah, yeah. So the people, that's one thing you don't realize is it's just even surface rust, you need to keep uh, some penetrating lube, some, some, you know, lube like a WD, but I like one that's even more oily like for guns. Keep that on there, so you so you. Don't. I used to keep acid in a spray bottle, and I'd spray them down all the time. There you go. So, anyway, that's how, that's what it takes to be cool. Use a yeah. bunch of work and money. To a bunch of work. Uh, AJ Squires says that he appreciates your input and says keep up the great work. Right. He's love your YouTube channel. Yep. Good guy. He says, what are the pros and cons of going to local guys for engine and suspension work versus big name? and brand shops or vice versa. In your experience, do you get the same level of work or is the technology that the big shops have everything these days? Thanks. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a tough one here. So you can, we can, we, we use both over our years. We have the luxury of being in Southern California where there's plenty of big shops 
as far as let's talk suspension first. You got Race Tech and Factory Connection and uh, AHM. We got uh, JBI down south. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit. They got tons of good suspension shops all around. Uh, Schmidt, good guy, smaller shop. Got good guys all around. Okay. And they're all different levels of the size of shop and, and the number of employees and their costs and overhead and so forth. So, one of the biggest things, so when you're weighing out costs where you live, uh, shipping is very expensive nowadays. To ship back and forth alone on suspension is expensive. So if you have a local guy that you can save on shipping and he's willing to work with you at the track or at least help you take stuff back after you talk to him, you've talked to him on settings, that that can be almost, in, uh, that, that's invaluable. So that, that can be better. So if you have a local guy that's highly recommended, I'm not opposed to guys using that. The advantage of a big name shop on suspension is that they uh, have lots of experience with testing with different bikes and guys. If you tell them specifically uh, your skill set, your weight, and all that, your bike, usually 90% of the time, it's there. Like with Race Tech and everything, uh, Factory Connection, you tell them your, your setup, Hey man, you're pretty close. So you don't usually have to do a lot of tweaking. Make sure you don't inflate your numbers. <laughs> right. <laughs> So or deflate your right. numbers. Yeah, sorry. All right. So then the next one would be engines. Uh, now, like our, our buddy Brad does a lot of engine rebuilds out of his out of his own home shop. That can be really helpful, and especially on four strokes nowadays, it's probably about the only way that's cost effective is to find somebody that's going to rebuild it from home. Um, and whether it's a mechanic, um, I tell guys if they can't find somebody is to ask the local pros who the mechanics are. They'll usually know somebody that's a good mechanic and see if they're recommended. So finding a local mechanic that can help you with that rebuild can, can be very useful. As far as performance goes, um, there's getting to be very limited shops. You know, the, the Twisted and Pro Circuit and Tom Morgan, there's not a ton, Race Tech's doing some now, some engine work. There's not a ton of performance engine shops like there used to be. XPR does stuff uh, and Temecula as well in California. And there's, there's some throughout the country, but it's getting somewhat limited. So uh, the best thing I would do on as far as performance goes is talk to people who have used the stuff on a similar bike for your area. So that's what I would recommend. Does Jamie now have a shop back east or something? He's, yeah, he's working on getting that all set up. He's got Dave Dye he's working with out there and oh, nice. got it all set up. So it's a big commitment. He's actually going out there for a few weeks. Florida, right? Yep. Nice. So it's going to be cool. Mm -hmm. So he's committed to, you know, he knows it's going to be closer for a lot of guys to be able to bring their bikes in and get the mods done, the same mods. And he got a dyno there, the whole deal. So it's legit. Uh, like if he's going to do it, he wants to do it right. So it's pretty cool. Mm, right on. I think it's Guy on Luca M. Yeah. That yeah. sounds good to me. Hey, Jay, I was always taught to lube the chain the night before I ride. So it gets tacky. But I see everyone lubing their chain before they get on the MX track. What should I be doing? What's a good lube to use? Also, what's the best way to spray under the fenders and skid plate before getting on the MX track so mud doesn't stick? Okay, nice. so a couple questions there. Let's do the mud first under the fenders. Uh, depending upon your conditions, we usually will just spray whatever lube we have, W40 or any type of, uh, what's what's the other one that we use? The Z-Max so, silicone Z, spray. Z-Max Z has a silicone spray or PAM. People will just use kitchen yeah. Pam and spray under the fenders. If it's really muddy, that stuff stays like that. And what that really that makes you hungry though when you're riding <laughs> and smell it. For us, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So this makes it so much nicer when you go to wash the bike. The stuff just comes off when you're able to wash it. You know, soon it, it comes off. So yes, having spray under the fenders. I like to put it under the engine cases. Uh, and and what you if you're used to washing your bike, you know kind of the areas where mud will stick. Hit those spots. Just be careful not to hit your rotors or your brake pads in those areas. Be watching for that. And when you take off through the pits, maybe hit those brakes a little bit so you get any residue off there before you get on the track. As far as chain lubes, we have a really good video of uh, Fort 9. We'll get, maybe get a screenshot. The thumbnail is up on the screen right now. Perfect. Fort 9 is really, I don't want to say astute, nerdy guy who's very smart. And he does some great... He's mainly a street bike guy. He's from Canada, and he's mainly a street bike guy, and he does some great videos. He did a really good one on chain lubes, and he tested them all with different things, and he came up with just what we did is the best time your chain is lubed is when your counter shaft seal is, is no good. That's when your lube, chain is lubed at its best, and that's because it wants oil. Chains just want oil. The Harleys 
drip? They have a drip. They have a drip. And is it on purpose? It's on purpose. Okay. I wasn't sure because they drip anyway. No, no, right. They drip anyway, but they have a drip. Multiple drip. spots. <laughs> well, yeah. This one spot is for the chain. The one on the right side of the engine is not for <laughs> right, that. Right, right. So I've thought about this for uh, dirt bikes over the years. I mean, I thought about it years ago is to have some type of canister, especially for trail and dual sport guys, some type of canister by the counter shaft. You know, it'd be tough fitting it in there, the room. And you would hold oil and you could hold a button. And it would just drip out. All machine spark. rooms have auto feeders for those. Yes. Yes. So we, can, we have to think about that. And if somebody is more smart than I and wants to make one, we'll be glad to show it right here. Yeah. And uh, that would be cool. So oil is the best thing. And you don't need to do it the night before. As far as tacky chain lubes, what we don't like about those, they can attract more sand and can get in there and sand your chain rollers and actually wear out your chain sooner. And that's one thing that this Fortnite guy came up with in this video is that it's... Uh, uh, that you're better off just having oil. Yeah. John R. says- That's our second John R., by the way. It's it, not it, the same guy. Not the same guy. It's spelled different. This is J-O-N. And I was, because I had to go check. I'm like, is this guy, there's really, and they were di they're different last names, you know? Yes. Uh, uh, but they were both R. I thought that yeah. was funny. You know, you can tell everybody's age by their name. Like, people don't name people John anymore. That's true. It got worn out. It's gotten it worn out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, he says, do you, we talked about this earlier, but do you have a recommendation or a link for pneumatic brake bleeders like the one you use? Yeah. The Google doc yeah. and uh, just hit our Google doc and we have great links to all the videos. Uh, and again, Spencer's really been working on that uh, Google doc to have it cleaned up to where you can find good info on there to help you out. All right. Kane K. What's up? Currently waiting on parts to finish on my first top end rebuild of my YZ250. What's your opinion on break-in procedure on a new top end? I've read so many different opinions on what to do, especially when using a Weisco piston. Okay. Well, obviously we use Weisco. So we'll throw it in a two-stroke like our 300. We're doing one next week uh, or this week for Don. We're doing a 300 two-stroke. Uh, we're going to put a piston in that. Um, these bikes typically will start them up. You said first start up, start them up, let them run for 30 seconds, look around, make sure nothing's leaking, make, make sure we didn't forget to tighten a hose clamp or didn't didn't tighten a nut down or something 30 seconds guys have this old myth about heat cycles you let it uh, you cycle up for four minutes here and let it cool for 12 minutes and then let it cool no there's no there's no big mythical thing like that so we, we let it start for 30 seconds check everything out okay and then uh usually then we'll, we'll let it finish you know looking over and then take it outside and start it up look it over again for 30 seconds and then ride it around slowly pit speeds i call it just burp, 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 no wide open so that way if something did happen it wouldn't be as catastrophic but uh typically we'll just ride around for five ten minutes let it cool down and you're ready to rip just take it to the track or trail if something's going to happen it's going to have already happened so um it, and if you have a problem when you get to the track or trail it's because of something else not because you didn't break it in there's really no real break in on these bikes if everything's set up correctly if you did it well there's no, there's no break in so what could happen like what's worst case scenario if somebody puts a piston in and a two stroke and goes straight to the track nothing really i mean other than if they messed up like say they didn't get the circlip in right and the circlip comes out okay that's on them no but, but then, all things being equal like if they go and they just and like yeah not really maybe maybe that ring seal isn't going to be maybe as good as it could have been if you just started it a couple times and rode it around slowly where that ring, those rings can really seal and wear in. So maybe that would be the little bit better benefit of taking your time a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Last question mm -hmm. from David H. Says Dunlop question. This has been driving me crazy to figure out what do the colored lines on the new tires mean? Is it to identify the tires on the rack so you don't have to see the sidewall or is it something else? So he's exactly right. So, and we'll have some pictures here of some tires but the stripes, we call them stripes in the tires, uh, those are identification marks. I think they use them at the factory and then at all the warehouses they use them and then the race teams use them in the semi truck. So when they have the tires like this, they know exactly what the blue red stripe here is versus the blue yellow stripe and then they're gapped at different places, they're staggered. And so over the years, we've been able to learn which one's which. I yeah, know but you got to change colors or... They do They do change colors. You have to change colors model. for new models. Yeah. Yeah. You exactly. just got to memorize them all. <laughs> you have an end service on which tire is which. <laughs> so those stripes are identification marks. And that really just helps with the manufacturing and warehousing and all that. So it's really cool. Uh, and I can tell you right now, like especially at the dump, uh, Dunlop truck, the pro guys, they have them all memorized. They know it's even the race tires. They have everything memorized. 
or what stripe is what. And so when they stack them, they're stacked and they know. And even at the at the amateur races, when they're set up doing tires that say Mammoth or Loretta's or whatever, uh, they have them stacked and they know that these are all the 120, 80, 34s and these are the 12090s. Do, does Dunlop make, I mean, I know they make one-off tires for certain situations. Do, do riders ever request one-off tires? Will they go to Dunlop and go, hey, like this is too hard here, or too soft there? Do you, you ever heard of any they, of that? They get some input, but they're not going to be able to make specific tires for guys. For a rider, yeah. E okay. Even if it was, uh, you know, the top is guy. You know? Yeah, yeah. So they're going to work with them and try to help them and maybe they can do some modifications to the existing tires to help them but they got a few tires to choose from and they're usually pretty that's pretty it. happy right? right yeah so album time what do we got that's our it CD? we're CD. ready to go album CD? time yeah okay 1990 queensrike and what's cool about this cd spencer's like that i he's he's realized when he goes through my cd you see a few of them i have the ticket stubs in here this one's from 1990 you can't save ticket stubs anymore because they're all digital that's terrible huh yeah you take a screenshot of your yeah. apple wallet <laughs> <laughs> your apple wallet your fills apple, up and fills up with you, you, you just you just print it off so they just leave it in the wallet you know when they're yeah, always yeah, left yeah. in there so the album is 1990 but the cd is 90 the, the concert was 91 and this was the main floor and it was 18 dollars with tax donnie noticed uh, so it was included 18 bucks on the floor uh so really good prices there right donnie yeah, it, it, uh, I just got some, my wife likes Sting, so I went and bought some Sting tickets. They weren't $18, I promise no. you that. No. <laughs> All right, so let's let's go through the songs here on Empire. Empire, now the album before this um, is um, Operation Mindcrime. Oh, brilliant, but it is, uh, it's, it's meant to be listened to as an entire album. It's this concept album, and it's really cool. It's got like a story going on, and it's 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 pretty neat. Uh, I listen to it at the gym when I have uh, like an hour, fifteen minute workout, and I can get the whole album. But it's definitely one of those albums where you have to listen to it. You're listening to the whole thing. The whole thing. Do you remember your first concert you went to? I mean, like, where would this be in the line of how many concerts you'd gone yeah, to? I'd gone to quite a few by this point. By this point, okay. Yeah. So the first ones are, you know, like Night Ranger and some of those in and back when I lived in Missouri. So so this this album had Best I Can, The Thin Line, Jet City Woman, Della Brown, Another Rainy Night Without You, Empire. Just such a cool song, Empire. For right? sure. Resistance, Silent Lucidity, which is their only like slow song hit, right? Um, but it's probably their biggest out of all time. Oh, yeah. It's probably their biggest recognized song. And that Jeff Tate, that was lead singer, he talked about that on a, something I listened to a while back, and he's talking about how people would show up thinking that's what they're going to listen to is Silent City, and they're just <laughs> blown away by Operation Mindcrime, right? And and they had all these visuals on the screens, and there's you know guys get in this sanitarium and getting somebody's getting shot and this and that so. did they close the concert do you remember this concert if they closed with silent lucidity i can't remember he can't Come remember on. yesterday I, I know but i I, I, remember, I remember a conversation <laughs> where somebody was like they closed the concert with silent lucidity and that's like that's a that's an interesting song to choose to close with right because right. it's like not usually you close with like a you know a real banger right yeah but, no, no, but he, he's prepping people to go home. Exactly. So he can, they can wind down <laughs> yeah. and leave the concert. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. So anyway, really good album. Uh, and their early stuff is really good. Uh, the Rage of the Order it has the uh, the Flame. That's the song I like. That that thing is just awesome. You know what's interesting? Like bands like this, they go through so many members yes. normally. Yeah. It's like you have a lot of times a lead singer and then they'll have – Ten well, guitarists. This is only about three years before, two years, two to three years before things just went boom yeah. for for hard rock in in the US. You can call it hair metal, but I call it hard rock and grunge. You can say thanks to Nirvana, right? And yeah, to yeah. all these bands, because look at what we're left with now. And I mentioned this last show, but those other musics make you want to, you know, maybe not. You know around. where you get to see these kinds of bands now? I've told you this before. Yeah, at Indian casinos, at the fairgrounds. Fair, they fair play grounds. fairs. They're back to fairs. They're back to fairs. That's where they started, though. That's where they started. They but they have a they have a new singer. Jeff Tate does his own thing, which yeah. is pretty good. And uh, but they have their own. And I'm going to a couple cool concerts in April. I'll talk about that later in Vegas. I'm going to a couple cool cool rock concerts, and I'm going to see Extreme. Uh, this weekend. Oh, gonna, really? Yeah. And, and oh, I uh, forgot all about the, Extreme. The Desert. Their new album is so good. We'll talk about that one sometime soon. It's called Six. So you can't talk Do you about have a their, CD for it? You can't talk I don't, about it. I'm their, going to get you it. Should, you should buy a CD yeah. and then we can feature it, right? And that's another thing I figured out is that there are... I had a bunch of CDs stolen when we lived... When at first we were married, 
uh, broke into our house and stole like half my seats. Where did you live? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only place I could afford to live. You drove, you drove me by that place and I didn't want to stop. <laughs> when I, it's in between here and Glen Helen and that's the problem, you know, and, and uh, but anyway, that's all we could afford. So, uh, yeah, they broke in and got you know, my speakers and TV and stuff. And Isn't it funny that to think about that they would steal CDs? Oh, so you know silly, I mean? really? Because like, what they get a, a, Two dollars a piece for them, right? You know, yeah. it, it, you know, it was just terrible. So anyway, all right. So great show, guys. Uh, Donnie, what do you got? You got a question to, f to end us out? Yeah, I got a question for you. So really, it's really just about your uh, your problems. What do you dislike doing the most in this industry? Oh, like man. where? What do you like dislike doing the most? And really, Tom Sawyer that onto others. I guess what I dislike the most is the stuff that I can't. Tom Sawyer onto others, mm -hmm. I guess, because then if, if I can get other people to do it, which a lot is the running around, but even that I don't mind so bad, but I do have some good helpers. I got a good helper, Cody, that helps a lot with running around. Yeah, but the running around is also relationships. Right. Uh, yesterday, I went to probably six, seven stops yesterday, and today we have a couple, you know, after this. So th that's not so bad. I guess the biggest thing is, the hardest part, I guess, is the... I guess, I don't know, maybe being on call, right? Like you're, I'm always having to, there's never a downtime, you know, you know, I work, you know, all the time. I try to not to work on Sundays, but then there's always something coming up. I got to do something uh, where I'm in the office working or doing this or that, or it's hard to stay caught up. A lot of this industry in total is a seven day a week industry. Right. People don't realize that, you know, these, the guy, even like supercross mechanics, they're working Sunday. Yeah. They end up, they'll build bikes the day after the race at wherever they're at and usually have like a midweek day off, but they're working mostly seven days a week too. Yeah. All right, man. It's been a great show. Um, appreciate it. Uh, remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that kind of cool stuff. And next show, I'm hoping to get our first mechanic on. We've talked about having a mechanic on with me and we can, a professional mechanic, uh, more so than myself. You know, like maybe one that's working for a race team or has his own shop. So we're going to try to break that into the, some of these podcast videos for you. And I'm really you excited about this. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a good mechanic. <laughs> Uh, with a, a good writer, but just having somebody else answer questions and kind of what their take on this yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, to break it up a little bit. I think it'll be nice. And we don't, we want to stay in our lane of the tech and, you know, this bike work stuff. So hopefully uh, guys will enjoy it. So hopefully you guys like it. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you guys for your help. We'll see ya. We work with some great companies. And here's a list of those right now Dunlop Motorcycle Tires, Wysco Piston. Vinco Air Shocks and Dirt Bike Parts, FMF Exhaust, Decal Works Graphics, Pro X Racing Parts, Recluse Clutch Revolution, Motion Pro Specialty Motorcycle Tools, Works Connection, Uni Filter, Klotz Oil, Cometic Gasket, MX Plastics, JE Pistons, Cardo Systems, ODI Bars and Grips. And remember, if you shop Rocky Mountain, use our link from our site, Linktree, or link in the description of the videos. Thanks for watching and listening. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.